So this video is an interview with Justin Hockevar, who is head of Enios Automotive for Asia Pacific, which is Australia, New Zealand, and a few more countries. Now, most of you are familiar with the Enios Grenadier, but for those of you that aren't, it's really quite a special vehicle because it is one of the few vehicles on the market which are purpose designed for off-roading, touring, overlanding, call it what you will. And it exists because a guy called Jim Ratcliffe looked at the vehicle market and decided there was no vehicle which fit his needs. Now, many of us do that, but most of us aren't billionaires with the wherewithal and uh, ability to start an automotive company from nothing and then create the vehicle that he actually wanted, which is exactly what Jim has done. So in this video, um, I'm going to be talking to Justin about INEOS in Australia. It will be applicable to other markets as well. I have put chapter links in there so you can jump around from place to place. And if you have questions or comments, please use the YouTube comment um, facility. I also hope to be doing some more work with INEOS in the future around the Grenadier. So with that introduction, now let's introduce Justin. So Justin, thanks very much indeed for coming on my webinar series. It's a real pleasure to have someone from INEOS talk to us because the Grenadier is such an important four-wheel drive. Um, could you just give us a bit of a background about yourself, including how to pronounce your name, because I'm not actually sure. <laughs> well, it's all, I've always found it a great mystery. Uh, it's been Australianised over the years. <laughs> so it's Hockabar. So Justin Hockabar uh, is my name. And um, yeah, so, I, I, you know, I've been around the automotive industry, um, mostly here in Australia for, for um, a couple of decades, let's just say, um, uh, always on the sort of imported distributor side, setting up and, and, and uh, establishing brands uh, yeah. or supporting brands that have needed recovery. Uh, so so um, this is a, a project that um, I feel quite well um, qualified for, let's say, experienced for. Um, I've come on to look after the Asia Pacific region. Um, there's really um, two core streams to my work in that regard. Uh, one is the setting up and establishment of direct distribution markets, which Australia and New Zealand fall under. So we've established two wholly owned subsidiaries of Ineos Automotive Limited, uh, being the global um, automotive company. Uh, two, two entities down here, so Ineos Automotive Australia Proprietary Limited and Ineos Automotive um, New Zealand Limited. Um, and then beyond that is the establishment of mostly uh, imported distributor relationships through, um, through other, uh, mostly smaller volume markets uh, within the Asia Pacific region. Uh, and I'm also responsible for uh, looking at uh, an, another emerging um, not an emerging market, another large market where we may also go direct, um, but there's more to follow on that in, in time to come. Right, thank you for that. And the first question is, where do you see the Grenadier? What, who do you see buying it in Australia and what do you see them doing with it? Yeah, so, well, I, I think that there's, um, there's four really clear target groups for us, you know, people that, that would be really interested in using the, the Grenadier uh, and we'll focus on them. Um, they probably, they sit sort of across a, a spectrum between, um, I guess, uh, work and to, to some extent leisure. Um, and, um, and, and, and an extreme end of work would be, um, you know, fleets and corporates, um, you know, whether that's emergency services, uh, perhaps the, you know, forestry or mining sector, so, so um, where we might be dealing with uh, large um, fleet management organisations and the like, uh, probably going through, you know, a procurement process to consider uh, the vehicle against others. Um, uh, adjacent to that, I would say, then, is um, uh, utilitarians, you know, small to medium enterprise customers that are really looking for a purposeful work vehicle to get the job done. Um, now, they could be people that are on the land. They could be people that, um, uh, you know, travel uh, around the country for work and, and need, um, you know, a capable vehicle in terms of what it hauls or the, the terrain it needs to cover. Um, a real dependable workmate. It could also be, um, you know, it could also be tradespeople that, you know, need to get access on site or lug tool trailers and the like. 
you know, maybe a veterinarian that, you know, is, is, is you know, got to go and, you know, pull calves in the middle of the night, um, you know, in a muddy paddock, you know, so quite a, quite a broad, broad spectrum of those sort of utilitarian customers. Um, Are there any specific vehicles which you have in mind? So, for example, when Ford brought out the Everest, they very firmly targeted that against uh, Prada, and there's been other examples. Any example, any um, similar thinking from Ineos? Yeah, look, I think that, um, well, what, what I would say is that um, it, it, the, the target um, competitive vehicles uh, come by virtue of what are the needs of the, those customers. So, um, and, and probably the vehicles that, that have um, fit that bill for them are either a dying breed, they're vehicles that have been around and either, you know, now at the tail end of their life cycle or, or have already gone, um, and that could be anything from, you know, the Y61 Patrol. It could be, could be um, you know, the forebears of the Land Cruiser. I guess the 70 Series range still sits in there on that sort of work, work and utilitarian end of the spectrum. Um, uh, you know, and, and, you know, and other vehicles of that, that like. Of, of course, we'll probably also uh, come up against, uh, you know, Team Thailand, you know, vehicles that have been mostly produced out of there because there's a lot of utility vehicles coming out of those markets. So, you know, Toyota, Ford, uh, you know, Mazda, Mitsubishi, Nissan, et cetera, are all going to fall within that mix. Um, we're probably at the more heavy duty end of the spectrum. Um, but, but, you know, I think we've got a, a number of attributes to offer that creates a significant point of difference from a lot of those vehicles as well. Okay. Um, so how is the Australian market different to other markets and how has um, your organisation, I guess, reacted to that and um, taken that into consideration? Well, well, once is, you know, sorry, one of the big considerations is the tyranny of distance, right? So we, we, we know that, you know, the, the vastness of Australia is, is really a big challenge and, and network is critical to that. We knew that for, for us to um, stand any chance down here, we needed to make sure that we had a network that was going to provide a reasonable level of coverage for most people, both for sales and service. Um, and is it? And, and you've probably seen in the past, Robert. You know, brands come and they sort of build their networks over time and, and gradually encroach on more regional areas. We, we took a we took a focus on making sure that our, from for, from day one we had a really big focus on regional areas um, within reason. You know. Um, we can't set up a full sales and service outlet, you know, in Broken Hill, but we can get one in Mildura because, you know, that population in that area is big enough. Beyond that, we've then got to look at, um, you know, how our servicing capability reaches beyond those sorts of centres. But, but, but as you've seen, you know, one outlet for every capital city um, out of about 33 nominated partners so far in Australia means that we are heavily skewed to regional areas. That's one aspect. Um, of, of course, tailoring the product to, to suit the Australian market has been important. So, you know, we paid a lot of attention early on into making sure that, you know, the vehicle was going to be well adapted to deal with heat, corrugation, dust, um, you know, that's some of the things that are really specific down here. Um, we've really driven that message home. And, 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 and of course, you know, the engineering product team's back back um, at head office know these things and they're aware of them and they've tried to accommodate all of our feedback as much as possible. Um, we've made some, um, you know, adapt um, some slight product adaptations as well for the Australian market. You know, we're going to include some additional filtration on the vehicle, uh, both on petrol and diesel. So diesel will include, you know, the addition of, you know, water separator and, and additional filtration because we just know that with fuel quality and, and, and the places people will travel, these are going to be important to to ensure mobility. Okay. Was there any specific Australian feedback, um, consultation of Australian four-wheel drivers, that sort of thing, which, which fed in, into this? Into the development? Yeah, yeah, there was. You know, so we were, you know, obviously there was a there was a number of enthusiasts that came out of the woodwork early on saying, you know, you know, we, we want to we want to talk to you and 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 offered up really willingly their their feedback, which was great. Um, the early days of the 2B tour sort of was starting to, well, in fact, that was sort of the, the tail end of, of the consultation locally. 
Um, mm -hmm. But we, we we did seek seek a lot of feedback, uh, also from the prospective agents within our within our agent network. There's some really experienced people that have done a lot of um, overlanding, four by four, um, uh, you know, travel preparation of expedition vehicles, um, you know, right through to motorsport, um, you know, production racing of, of off road vehicles. Um, and so these were really good um, stakeholders to engage and, and have a chat about what do we need to make sure we get right for Australia. Okay. Now, as we know, um, Australian four-wheel drivers love to accessorise their vehicles. So um, how is uh, Enios working with the aftermarket um, to allow some of the accessories which are typically um, provided, anything from roof racks, winches, um, possibly heavier duty suspension, different tyre options, um, that sort of modification, long range tanks. Yeah, so this has been a, you know, a really interesting piece of work uh, because traditionally auto brands tend to take a, you know, a fairly closed um, approach to um, protecting their own commercial interest in their own range of accessories. Um, we've really um, gone out and said, um, well, one, We've got our own range that we want to promote. We want to make sure that it's um, fit for purpose, price competitive, you know, and, and available early on. Uh, so, you know, you'll see that some of those items. We, we haven't designed and developed them all ourselves either. In, in many cases, we've gone to the experts and said, right, we need you to help develop uh, these accessory items for us. And, and there are Australian companies that have been uh, and South African and, you know, European companies that have been involved in that mix. Um, the next, you know, layers are where we get more open. So, um, and the closest ones we've sort of gone to, to engage at a more, you know, contractual level, let's say, to say, to, to partner up with them and say, okay, well, we're going to provide you with CAD data on the vehicle ahead of its launch. Um, we, th this is the range of accessories that we're going to do. We think that there's scope for you to develop some more items in these areas, um, and, um, and and so there's been a, you know already good dialogue. What we hope that does is accelerate the process, where those aftermarket providers would typically then come in and you know purchase a vehicle or get one access to one after series production has begun, um, and then you know they have to go down, they have to scan and pull apart and engineer and design and develop and test. Um, before they they bring it to market, you know, a year after the vehicle's been launched. Um, so we hope that that will help accelerate it. And then, you know, I've gone, you know, for, for example, I went along to, you know, a, an aftermarket industry um, seminar and, and did, a, you know, did a talk there and, and, and mentioned to all the, you know, the, the members there that, you know, we're, we're open for business, we're happy to engage with them, and, um, which, which I think that they found was refreshing to hear from an OEM. And, um, uh, and in some cases, we've said to them, hey, we still don't have solutions for certain items on the vehicle, so let your imagination uh, and, and the commercial opportunity run wild and let us know what you'd like to do. Um, the utility rail on the vehicle is a great example of that. You know, we think that that's, a, that's something that's still open for a lot of um, experimentation. Yeah, because yeah, typically what will happen, um, viewers, is that a new vehicle will come to market and the aftermarket don't want to invest in um, any gear for it because they don't necessarily see that people will buy it, but people won't buy it unless the aftermarket is geared, it, um, is available. So in the case of something like a new Hilux, aftermarket would be all over that. They'd go to Thailand, they'd develop beforehand. Something new like this, they're going to hang back a bit. So what you're saying, Justin, is that when the Grenadier is actually on sale, there's very likely to be quite a lot of aftermarket kit available for it. Ready? Well, we'd like to, we'd like to think so, uh, Robert. We think that, the, that we have helped to, um, you know, give, give those, um, those companies an understanding of what the commercial opportunity is, you know, how many vehicles are we going to sell, what's our order right looking yeah. like, et cetera, by fast-tracking it with access to CAD data you know, that hopefully reduces their investment and development um, and giving them access to our network is, is also another, another thing. But, yeah, but, but at the end of the day, it will always be their decision, that commercial yep. decision on how much they're willing to invest in development and tooling, et cetera. Yeah, well, um, that's good because, I mean, I've had to sort of source behind the scenes vehicles a few times for aftermarket people because the OEMs just don't want to cooperate. So it's really good to see, just see the attitude. 
So at this point, I'm going to do a short explanation of Australian vehicle classifications because it's pertinent to the next bit. Now, there's many different ways you can modify a vehicle and they're covered by things like the VSB or VSI8 from Vic Roads and many more. And a lot of that is to do with what sort of vehicle it is. So here's the national federal classifications. Starts with MA, which is for passenger road cars, then MB, that's things like people movers, then MC, which is your off-road passenger vehicles, and that's typically your wagon four-wheel drives, or should be. MC1 is 2,700 kilograms, the MC2 is over. NA, that's your light good vehicle, and that's typically your ute, so that uh, something like a Fortuna would typically be an MC, something like a Hilux would typically be um, an NA. Now there's two within NA, the NA1, NA2, different GVMs, and then there's the NB, which is goods vehicles over 3,500, and then you've got your NB1, and that's what the Grenadier is, which has a GVM of just over 3,500, and NB2 is over 4,500. So those are your classifications. Now what does it mean? Well, here's an example out of VSI8 from Vic Road. You can see there that you can raise the vehicle 75 mil total, provided it's an NA, NB1, MC, or MD. It doesn't say, um, MA, which is passenger car, and that's why I was so hot on trying to get Ford to change the Everest classification from MA to MC, which is what it should have been, and we were successful in that, and have Alan Jeep and, and others um, followed through in, eventually as well. Uh, here's another example. So um, this is about uh, track and offset. You can see it specifically mentions MC, NA, and NB, and not um, the passenger car ones, and there's a lot of confusion around uh, track on offset so I've made a special video to bust some of those myths so please watch that. So basically the classification of the vehicle affects things like your modifications, the safety features it has to have, the tax brackets, the fuel and emission standards, noise, anti-theft, lighting road and more so it's important to know what classification your vehicle is in because that affects how you own, operate and modify it. What safety rating is being aimed for with the vehicle? Well we're not um, we're not pursuing, a, you know, a, a safety rating agency score. What we're what we're really focused on is building a safe vehicle, um, and we know that there's there's minimum safety requirements that we have to meet in many ju different jurisdictions around the world. That's been part of developing a global vehicle, and we'll make sure that it meets those, and in, in, in many cases, exceeds. Um, so, uh, and for this type, style and category of vehicle, we're making sure that it's got good levels of safety equipment. So all the testing, crash testing is being done, but we're not necessarily subscribing to a ratings agency to, to you know, get a star um, rating. We know that that will always be, uh, if you were to go down that path, that would always be challenging for this type of vehicle in the direction that those rating agencies are going. Um, it's, it's size, it's mass, it's uh, shape. Uh, uh, doesn't lend itself well to all the the the, um, the, um, the ratings that they're pursuing these days. What we're trying to do is build a, a vehicle that's safe for our target customers in mind, and, and we, we we will be able to deliver upon that. Um, but but I think also that you know the, the category that we'll be launching that vehicle in here in Australia is not one that is uh, well has a rating uh, on it either. So um, that sort of you know, moves us beyond that point in some respects. Yeah, um, the reason I ask is, as you know, many fleets do mandate five star. And I can tell you that a lot of people who, who follow me uh, do consider safety as, as a factor, maybe not the overriding factor, but it's certainly, I mean, I, I get sent, um, complicated spreadsheets of vehicles weighted for my comment and you know so safety is in there somewhere for that so um, that's the reason uh, for asking around the ANCAP rating. Yeah so, so we'll, the vehicle for Australia will be um, launched in the NB1 category um, so NB1 you know is medium goods carrying vehicle as you would know um, it's not um, a, a category that has a safety rating um, applied to it um, and I think that that's the, the key difference with a lot of the, as you say, a lot of uh, fleet operators in particular have policy um, around, you know, what types of vehicles that they, they, they purchase. Those policies can range from everything from, hey, does it have the safety equipment that we're looking for, the right number of airbags, stability systems, electronics, et cetera, um, to right through to just using a, you know, a star rating from ANCAP as being the, um, the, the, the guide. 
um, we, when it comes to NB1, that, that, that's the latter is sort of um, your point. So, um, but, but we also see that with some fleet operators, even though they've got policy, they need to make exceptions for certain categories of vehicle um, because there's no other solution for them. Yeah. 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 All right. So we've talked of the aftermarket um, gear as well as obviously using it for off road. We have to talk about warranty. So, a couple of questions. First one is how long is the warranty likely to be? I think the industry is really um, solidified on five years for the moment, with some out, out at seven, three years. I don't know if there's anyone left on three years. Um, and whether or not, or to, to what extent, the warranty will cover off road and also. Um, aftermarket gear? Yeah, so um, our warranty policies haven't been finalised yet to, to, the, to the full extent. What we can say is that we're going to launch the vehicle with a five-year unlimited kilometre warranty. You know, so, uh, and so for, for Australia, that's, you know, the full, you know, bump, you know, bumper to bumper kind of uh, manufacturer's warranty includes paint. Um, uh, you may have noticed there's a different... Um, warranty figure out there for some other regions, but yeah. for Australia, it is a five-year warranty. Um, and we also offer a five-year warranty on our OE accessories range. Um, you know, what other aftermarket accessory providers um, that we might be working with uh, providing by way of warranty will be up to them. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of, um, I, I guess, you know, you know with, with the fitment of, of many accessories, um, and deviation from the homologated standard of the vehicle, mm -hmm. this is where, um, you know, it becomes a fairly grey area for, for, for many to deal with. And we know that some automotive, some OEMs take a very um, black and white view to it. You know, I, th I think that what we need to look at, we need to look at this really pragmatically and say we're building a purposeful 4x4 four four, uh, utilitarian vehicle. We know that some people will want to, um, run different types of tyres on them. We might see some people want some additional ground clearance um, or, or, you know, some of those other things that they'll do, they'll do that would technically modify the vehicle. Mm. Um, if we consider that, that, you know, that any modification of the vehicle has been to the detriment, uh, you know, of the vehicle's um, quality, we'll have to take a, you know, a standpoint on that. But, but I think we can equally look at a situation and go, well, that, that reasonably hasn't um, impeded upon the vehicle in any way and therefore we would, you know, honour the individual uh, warranty claims that would come on that vehicle. Okay. So with the dealer network and um, staff, then one thing I've noticed over the years is that when a car maker shifts niches, um, it can be very difficult for the staff to follow that and understand a new breed of customer. So I'll give you two examples. One is when a car maker noted for rather boring cars suddenly introduces sports cars and they've got people who want to drive them on racetracks and they don't know what to do with them it's, and actually care about the car very much as to who touches it and, and everything else. You know, suddenly their pride and joy, whereas what they sold before was really just an appliance. That they struggle to deal with that. And then secondly, also, um, with four-wheel drive, same sort of thing. All of a sudden, a dealership's got people who drive off-road and they're coming in with an accessories and, you know, your standard sedan typically doesn't come in with $30,000 worth of accessories and they can't deal with that. So what can you say to the, the viewers about, I guess, how INEOS really understands at a deep and almost personal level about what four-wheel drivers do in Australia, what they get up to, what the vehicle means to us, and that it's not just a vehicle, it's actually our lifestyle and it's our means to adventure and, and, and holiday. Yeah, so I, I think that, that that's a really good point, um, Robert. And, and, you know, if I sort of hark back to that, you know, who are our target customers? Because I sort of spoke about the work end of the spectrum. Um, and, and you've just touched upon the other end of the spectrum, people will buy the vehicle for their leisure. You know, so, you know, people that really, it's part of their lifestyle. They might live and work in a city or in the country for that matter, um, but, you know, they dream of getting away, you know, and that's their either their off-road travel or because they're going to an equestrian event and they tow or their caravan or grey nomads, you know, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the Malibu wakeboard boat and their weekends away requires that tow vehicle. So that lifestyle... 
And then on the really far spectrum is, is those people that, you know, they apply all the, the jewellery to the vehicle, you know, all those modifications and accessories, et cetera. They're the real extremists. And, and so we, we, we've got those four target groups really closely in, in our focus. Um, and, and this is the thing, as, a, as an automotive brand, we, we don't do a five-door hatch in A, B and C segment. You know, we don't do sedans and vans and everything. We, we really do one thing and we're focused on doing that very well. And when we've gone out there to identify our network partners, um, one, we're not, we're not engaging them through a, a kind of wholesale franchise model where we just, you know, push inventory out to them and leave them to... Um, as, you know, to, to, to manage the, re, the relationship with the customer, we've got a direct distribution model where we need to intimately understand who our customers are. Uh, we're transacting with the customer. So it's a direct transaction between the customer and the OEM. Um, so we own the inventory where we've got a lot of skin in the game with that <laughs> with regards to that. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, we set pricing and so on. So... Um, so I think we absolutely have to have a really clear understanding of the, the use cases and, and what people want to use it for. And, and we've tried to go out and identify agents in our network that are going to be really well suited to that. So we didn't go out and say, um, you know, can we go to one of the big publicly listed groups and try to find, you know, a chunk of 10 agents at a time to give us really quick network coverage. We've gone out there and really cherry-picked um, people, literally people, oper owner-operators of businesses that we know, that we've had experience with, and we think have got um, good operational oversight of their business, good, good connection with their customers, understanding of their customers. Um, and I think that some of them will be better at it than others, and some of them will be really good at dealing with, you know, fleet and, and utilitarians, and others will be really good at dealing with the, the, the more lifestyle and, and extreme users. Um, and, I, and, and I think also within our network you'll see um, this, this is sort of demonstrated because it's not just traditional auto dealers. There's plenty of traditional auto dealers in there and it'll, be, it'll, it'll look like they've added another brand to their portfolio in the franchise group. Um, but if I give you examples of SLRV on the Gold Coast, you know, these guys are expert at building, you know, yeah. um, overlander trucks. If I give you uh, Fraser Motorcycles in Newcastle and um, Wollongong, um, that do Harley Davidson, Ducati, and KTM and the likes. Um, they're down there at their dealership every weekend, um, you know, putting on the sausage sizzle, getting people to come along, going on rides with their customers. They've got a really hands-on relationship, um, and, and that's why we really wanted to target those sorts of people. They know about accessorising bikes for their customers, et cetera. Mm. So I, I, yeah. I, I think we've got a good mix. Okay. Yeah, um, I, I think SLRV are, are probably a good example because they would understand the difference between a centre diff lock and a cross axle diff lock, um, for example. But one thing about the Grenadiers, I'm sure you've noticed, is that the, there's a lot of very passionate, highly technical people here because the, the car isn't interested in their lifestyles. When they walk into a dealership um, or speak to anyone, they, they want to know that they understand um, how low range works and they've been stuck yeah. once and you know is that and um, a motorcycle dealer um, I would suggest might have a fair way to go to reach that level of real knowledge um, whereas SLRV um, I wouldn't as an example. Yeah and, and look it's a good point so, so look identifying the right partner is the first step in the equation then after that they've got to recruit the right team and, and in some cases they don't they may not have that talent in their business right now and they'll need to bring it in. But beyond that, we will then make sure that we train those people. So, um, you know, we, we will, you know, at the moment we're planning out for the, you know, in the, the fourth quarter of this year where we will be doing our um, internal launch, yeah. um, you know, and, and taking all the, the agent network, both people in the front end of the business that are going to be dealing with customers, but also equally people in the back end of the business that will be servicing vehicles and looking after them. So um, those people will get to, uh, they'll be fully trained on the product, how to use it, uh, all the intricacies of it. So, yeah, I, I think to your point, that's going to be something that we've really got to build a depth okay. of understanding on. Yeah. yeah. Do you have any plans for a, 
I guess, customer slash owner slash enthusiast um, scheme. You know, other car makers have done something similar. Hyundai's got their end, end system for um, for their owners. Um, Toyota have done things in the past. I see we've got Club D Max, etc. Any plans for that, or are you just flat out just trying to do everything else at the moment? Um, we're flat out doing lots of things. It's true, um, but that that one is absolutely firmly on the radar. Um, you know that 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 is a really important thing that we want to deliver upon. Um, so we, we've we've got a concept. Uh, we've got a name for it. Uh, we're we're working on the detail of it. I think that the culmination of that, you know, without giving too much away too soon, but um, the the culmination of that will probably be an annual event where we bring like minded people together and celebrate the brand and the product and. And, and share time. Uh, you know, I think that that's a great platform where people from the company, people like me and all the team, uh, our agent network and our customers can all come together and, and, and share experiences. Um, I think that that's, you know, something that we really want to do. If I was to look for inspiration, the best example of it that I know of in the Australian market is the long running, you know, more than two decades now, I think, is the BMW Safari. What they, BMW Motor Ad offers for its owners. You know, I think it's a, a classic example of getting people together, having a great event, uh, sharing great experiences. Yeah, um, I, I agree with that. And um, my, my current favourite from the four-wheeled industry is definitely what Hyundai are doing with their end car. It's a different segment, sports cars, but I think a lot of the principles really translate across and the way they built that is just incredible. But yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, for towing, now towing is obviously critically, critically important to Australia, um, three and a half tonne tow rating here. Can you comment on what that actually means? Because one problem I've got with Australian tow ratings, they don't follow the international um, uh, standards. And so a tow rating can just be whatever the manufacturer says. Um, what... I mean, obviously the vehicle can tow three and a half tons, but is it designed to do that day in, day out? Um, what testing has been been done? Um, can you just comment a bit about the towability? Yeah, so so towing was a really core part of what the vehicle was de developed to be able to do, um, and I and I've had quite lengthy conversations with you know members of the engineering team back in Germany um, around you know their 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 philosophies of. of, of what they set out to achieve, what they've tested for over time so that they could accommodate a really broad range of towing scenarios. You know, you think of that, that spectrum that I mentioned before, you know, people that would tow for work and some of the, the types of load, mm -hmm. you know, the, the heights, the weights, the, you know, the, the configurations through to, through to the more leisure end of the market, I guess, and, 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 and how that varies. Um, and, the, the, the core stability of the vehicle when towing um, is something that has been absolutely at the forefront of their, their, their mind. And, the, and, the, and through the development phases, 1A, 2Bs, and even you know, now with PTO, PTO 1s and 2s coming on, the PTO 1s in stream and now PTO 2s, um, they, they have seen ad adaptation, you know, changing spring ratings, moving, uh, moving damper positions, um, um, transition, you know, between progressive and linear springs on, on the vehicle to m make sure that, that that stability when towing, stability in a whole range of situations, but of course when towing and with heavy loads is really optimised. And, and I know that this is something that they've really um, prided themselves on being able to achieve is, is that is that towing, you know, because as you, as you know, like in Europe, you know, 80 kilometer an hour speed limits, um, you know, different different load ratings, et cetera, et cetera, that they're, 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 the scope of, of, of what they had to do was much broader than that. Yeah, and we've got massively high table mass as well. So I'm always cautioning people looking at Euro cars, just look for that table mass, don't look at the max table. So I'm happy to report, I think the Grenadier's got a 350 kilogram table mass. And as always, every time someone got hold of the European specs and panicked. So yeah, that happens happens quite frequently. Ah, yeah. um, uh, yes, that did happen. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's almost, almost predictable if, every time a new car comes out. So... Um, Moving on to different uh, variations, we've got the wagon at the moment. Lots of Australians uh, love utes, and there is a ute on the way. Can you comment on what that might look like relative to the wagon? Would it have more payload, for example, presumably a longer wheelbase, and when we might expect to see it? Yeah, um, 
I'll tell you what I can um, because there's some things I'm not, you know, I, I'm not privy to talk about just yet. Um, so, uh, but but look, a dual cab utility, um, as we like to call them, uh, dual cab ute, uh, as the rest of the world calls a, a dual cab pickup, um, is is on the way. It's in the making. It's in development. Um, it will be on a longer wheelbase. Uh, you know approximately 300 mil longer wheelbase. Uh, so that will obviously give it, um, you know, a bit more um, scope over the, over the rear axle for load carrying, et cetera. Um, uh, I, can't, I can't comment on payloads just yet. I think there's still a lot of work to be done in that regard. Um, but, you know, look, you, you can see that we've already moved to a GBM here in Australia of, of 3550. So we're, we're sort of nudged up in that MB1 category. And, and I'd say it's highly probable that we will we'll be in the same category for a dual cab. Hmm. Um, we, we plan to offer it both with a tub and as a cab chassis. Uh, so, you know, that's, that, that's something that is absolutely on the cards. Uh, we think it will be, a, a, you know, a really important vehicle within the portfolio down here. It's certainly something that's been, you know, it's very attractive to us and our network. Uh, and I think it's what's really helped aid the rapid expansion of our network. Yeah. Okay. Now, one of the key issues for any four-wheel drive, and this is probably the most important design aspect for a touring four-wheel drive, is reliability but not just reliability something i call graceful degradation when one part of the car fails it doesn't bring everything else down so i've been on trips for example we've had um, a wheel speed sensor um, sometimes known as an ABS sensor pull out and that has basically disabled the entire car and it shouldn't do that i've even seen a case of the sat now failing and somehow disabling the car how that was all connected together i don't know but it did and it seems more and more of cars they'll go they're not obeying Isaac Asmiov's law of robotics. You're just going, okay, I've got a problem here. I am now going to just crawl in underneath nearest bush and drip fluids in, in terror. And, you know, I'll, I'll, it doesn't work in, in the outback. And we need to be able to make a decision and say, look, um, if I need to get over that sand dune, I'm going to need 4,000 revs. And if you don't want an engine, I want I need you to give that to me so I can get over that June, then I'll rest you for a while, I'll put more water in, whatever else there. So what I'm saying is reliability is one thing, but also uh, graceful degradation. So if something does fail, the car keeps going, and fundamentally it almost dies before that engine stops turning those wheels. All the electronics can go, the gear shift can go to, to some extent, but it still keeps going. You see what I'm saying here? Yeah, I do, yeah. And, and look, I think that, you know, you're familiar with the, the, the design intent and what we've tried to achieve with the Grenadier and, 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 and this philosophy of being um, as durable as, uh, and, and um, to, to maintain mobility. So that, re that, that reliability um, in remote areas is something that we've tried to factor into the build. Um, in this day and age, there's certain electronics that you just can't avoid. Um, you know, whether it comes back to the safety related systems, the emission systems, et cetera. But we've been able to achieve, um, you know, a, a build that at the moment we're, we're running um, approximately 50% the number, number of um, electronic components that some of our, you know, and computer systems that some of um, the other brands have gone to with their more SUV type products. Um, you know, we, we consider this a utility vehicle. It has to be capable, it has to be durable, it has to be dependable. Um, and that's why we have opted for some simplicity in some of the systems that we've used on the, on the vehicle. You know, um, we, we, you know we, we've gone for, you know, rigid axle. We've gone for, um, you know, you know, um, you know, rather than using uh, traction control systems to, um, optimize, you know, um, uh, its four-wheel drive capability uh, in, you know, in terrain, in various different types of terrain, et cetera, we've gone for quite a basic, you know, e-locker system that's, that's quite uh, robust, dependable, analog, you could say. It's, you know, it's old school vinyl versus, um, you know, iTunes. Um, it's, it, it's, it's something that has been tried and tested over a long time. Now, we've had to put that into a modern context, of course, but, um, but we think that by the way we've packaged the vehicle um, with, with quite heavy duty, durable materials, that, that it should deliver upon that reliability. Okay, so let's talk about the futures then. Um, 
everyone is moving to electric vehicles. Um, yeah. That's just the way the industry is going. Now, uh, the problem with electric vehicles for the people who are likely to buy the Grenadier and, and follow my work is that the electric vehicle range simply isn't anywhere near long enough. And I've got a video where I explain that in, in great detail. But nevertheless, that is where things are going. Um, and at some point, then uh, internal combustion engines will be banned or massively deprecated. So what is the INEOS plan to deal with that? Is the answer perhaps just keep us going as far as we can with, with, with diesel or um, attempt to make an, an EV or shift to hydrogen or, or, or what? Yeah, the, the, the development of the Grenadier was never something that would be sort of um, just set in stone as being, um, a, you know, a permanent solution. We have to evolve. Um, and and if, and then if this point in time between all of the factors of weight, cost, range, uh, you know, the impact of towing and heat or cold on, on batteries and range, then we could have probably launched with a very different outcome. And, and maybe we would have launched as an electric vehicle, who knows? But right here, right now, we knew that there was enough customers out there around the world, had to be a global vehicle, um, but around the world still had a need for this type of vehicle. And an internal combustion engine, petrol and diesel, was the only way of achieving that. And that's why we offer it in EU4 or EU6 configurations to meet those different markets around the world, their fuel quality, qualities, et cetera. Um, the infrastructure is not there everywhere yet either. Um, so, and whilst we're not um, a brand that sort of um, flicks the forks at, at, at electric vehicles, we acknowledge how important they are in their place, uh, you know, in, in terms of um, certain use cases and particularly people that are in, you know, uh, and got access to the infrastructure infrastructure and, and the range doesn't impede upon what they do, then that makes complete sense. We get it. But, but if you want to tour, if you want to tow heavy things, if you want to deal with the extremes of temperatures, um, right here, right now, the only way to deal with it is internal combustion. And so that's what we've, we've kicked off with that. But we will evolve. Uh, we, we, and, you know, part of why we've chosen, you know, uh, the, the engine um, powertrain partner that we've got is because we need to have an evolution over time to meet emissions increasingly more stringent emissions requirements around the world. Now, we have announced that we will be um, uh, launching a hydrogen fuel cell prototype later this year. So that, you know, obviously Ineos um, uh, Group has, has got a lot of interest in, uh, in hydrogen um, and um, big announcements uh, earlier this year around uh, investment in the production of green hydrogen. So that's, um, you know, sort of very much is in our lane, so to speak. Now, um, and, and, and just recently, uh, you know, our, our chairman also announced that um, we would be looking at a, an, another version, uh, another product within the portfolio that would be smaller and, and, and looking at that being uh, an electric solution is more likely based on its size, et cetera, et cetera. Um, albeit always remaining true to our DNA. Yeah, okay. So speaking of propulsion then, um, there will be a petrol and a diesel, which um, is interesting given that virtually other, every other manufacturer has uh, phased out their petrols and I've spoken to them and it's like, you know, nobody really wanted to buy them. Um, and um, yet uh, here you are in Australia offering a petrol, which personally I think is kind of a smart move because I feel that, this, that the tide's going to start swinging back towards petrol. Um, what drove the decision to offer petrol as well as diesel and what sort of sales percentage um, split do you expect? Yeah, well, if I was to look at the industry numbers, you know, you'd say, why would you need to even offer the petrol in this particular category of vehicle? Because diesel is still quite dominant. But, but we, the, the, I think that the indicators are there across other sectors uh, and there is also a lot of customer feedback around people that... Um, uh, see the benefit in petrol. Obviously, petrol's uh, fuel economy has come a long way as well. Um, I, I think that um, some um, uh, parts of the community have also had changing views around diesel as well as a fuel. 
um, and and that's sort of swung them back in in in, you know, in favour of petrol. Um, from an order take point of view, we're we're not communicating all of our numbers just yet, but I would say that I'm uh, pleasantly surprised that the um, petrol order take has been stronger than we anticipated. You know, I think that um, you know. To, to give you an, an indication, you know, I would have been surprised if we went beyond five percent petrol at first, uh, and I would and I would say we're probably heading in the direction of being nearly three times that. Um, you know, still a lot of water to go under the bridge before we see final uh, numbers hit the road, but um, that's a that's a pretty strong um, indicator of a shift in people's mm. mindset and 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 buying behaviour. Hmm. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. And I think that's only going to start to get stronger um, as, as well. Okay, so um, what's the business plan? So Ineos is a, is a new brand. It's well-funded. There's a lot of momentum behind it. But um, what confidence could you get pe- give people that the uh, brand will be around in, in 10, 15 years' time? Because, again, for when you buy a four-wheel drive, um, it's a massive investment because it's an expensive vehicle. And then you spend not only a lot of money, I mean, fit out to 30, 50K, are not unusual, but also a lot of your personal time in it. So it's not necessarily something you want to swap over every five, eight years. You want to have some confidence that the company is going to be around um, for, for quite a while. Yeah, look, I think that, you know, people should feel confident, you know, and hopefully the proof is in the pudding, you know, we're, that, the, you know, we're, we're, a, a company and a brand that that has done everything it said it would do. Um, it's not vaporware. <laughs> it's 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 not been just developing a concept and and and, and stringing it along. We've we've invested heavily with all the right partners. We've got long term supply agreements. We've gone and purchased the plant with uh, you know with, with uh, ongoing contract manufacturing, which was an incredible cue to to be able to. Um, to, to pull that off, um, you know, to, to get a fully operational plant that was so young with big investment in it, in the Stuttgart manufacturing precinct with access to talent, et cetera, et cetera, and to pick up contract manufacturing, um, you know, it, all of these things I, I would like to think bode really well to demonstrating to customers that um, we're not in this as a flash in the pan. <laughs> this isn't a flash in the pan. We're in this for the long haul. Um, deeply committed to it. You know, we're establishing our own distribution around the world. We're appointing distributors around the world. So, yeah, it's a it's a brand that's deeply committed to a long-term play. Okay. Now, one thing which is unusual about INEOS is the fact that you and other INEOS staff are actually in the enthusiast um, Australian INEOS owners group and presumably other places as well engaging. And um, I have never seen that before from any car company ever um i'm very interested to know well first of all thank you on behalf of of the enthusiast community for doing that i think it's great but i'm interested to know what drove that decision and what other similar initiatives uh might be along the way as opposed to the very much i guess hands-off distant attitude most car companies have to their customers yeah, well, it, it, this is a people business, um, and 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 I think understanding your customer is critical. Um, you know, we're we're in this startup phase. We 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 said that we wanted to have a relationship directly with customers. You know, we plan on ha- well, we will have a contract of sale directly between the OEM and the customer. Um, we we didn't want to have a filtered existence behind a franchise network. Um, and, and right now, when we've got the ability to still form things, to be creative, to think outside the box and, and try to build a business model and pricing and specification and service and all the things that are going to come together, um, having our finger on the pulse and listening to enthusiasts, I think, is invaluable. It's, it's just such um, a great opportunity. It's it's very difficult to, thing to manage, though, because you've got to try to... Um, filter out what's really important to the majority of people um, and not be too distracted by some of the extremes of what's wanted. You know, that's that can be achieved, but it can be achieved after market. Um, and, and because if we were to homologate 
and develop, you know, in all these global markets, in just the states of Australia before you start thinking about all the other markets around the world with yeah. crash testing and emissions and, you know, the diff- you know, different types of tyres and rolling tests and noise. And, it, you know, it, it is such a, a myriad of different things that you need to bring together. If we tried to accommodate all those things, we would never launch. We, this would be a vehicle for 2030. And by that stage, you know, the 10 years of developing it would be, you know, <laughs> null and void. So um, I think that, um, yeah, but I, look, I think it, it, for many brands, you, the policy usually exists, don't get involved in, in those sorts of places, um, you know, and staff don't tend to go there um, it, 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 because it can be quite tricky. Um, to manage, but but we wanted to have that relationship. We've gone there. Um, we've tried to listen as best as we can. We've tried to adv- provide advice as best as we can, and hopefully it's been of some benefit. Great. And um, what have you learned from, from the interaction thus far? Um, there is an abundance of passion. Great. <laughs> yeah, no, look, there has been... Um, look, I think that there's a whole bunch of people that I'm looking forward to having a beer with, um, you know, and, and talking about their experiences. The exciting thing for us now as we're getting closer and closer to launching vehicles and handing them over to customers is um, we can't wait to see the, the things that they're going to do with these vehicles, the places they will go, where they will explore, the work that they will achieve. Um, you know, that's... You know that's 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 what this is. Um, you know what, what will really motivate the team here um, when our when our network opens up and and um, you know that the, they employ their full teams uh, that are out there uh, celebrating the brand and using the product. You know in their spare time too. Yeah, we that, that's the stuff we, we're working towards. Yeah. Okay. So that's the end of my questions. Is there anything you'd like to? say any message you'd like to give to the people that typically follow made a touring four-wheel driver technical people? Yeah, look, I think that, you know, we, we, we hopefully we've demonstrated that we're trying to listen to, to um, what people want in their vehicle. Um, we're not um, just getting towed along in a general direction of building sort of ubiquitous cookie cutter SUVs. Uh, we we want to stay true to certain values. Um, and you know, and hopefully, if they identify with those 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 values in the, in the vehicle, um, we we open you know the opportunity to engage with them to talk about what we're doing, and, and we really look forward for, to giving them an opportunity to test drive the vehicle. That's that's the ultimate test, right? You know, is when you when you put your your bum in the seat and your hands on the wheel and and put it through its paces. Great. Well, Justin, thank you very much indeed for your time. And if anyone viewing this has any questions, please drop them in as comments. And I hope you found this video useful and thank you for watching.